Um, I think a lot of people were here yesterday, which is great, but for the people who weren't, I'm just going to give a brief overview and welcome for Joshua Clover again, who um, is our guest speaking again today. Um, and just as a reminder, tomorrow there'll be an open seminar for students, faculty, and public, which will probably be a little bit smaller, a little bit more intimate. So if you really have enjoyed the talk either yesterday or today or both of them, tomorrow is a good time to come and tell Joshua why you think he's like totally right and give him more ideas or why he's totally wrong and why you hate his book and just like burn it right there in front of him. And yeah, he'll probably appreciate that actually. Um, so 12 o'clock tomorrow in Social Sciences 8108. Um, so I did like a, I'm going to give like a general bio for Joshua, but um, I thought in the way of kind of like being a little bit more creative, yesterday I did kind of like a sweet, like, oh, this is why I think Joshua Clover is so awesome um, introduction. So um, given his gesture of like the dialectic hand yesterday, I thought it would be nice to introduce him by way of some popular stances of opposition that he has taken um, in the history of things. Um, so <laughs> I would say we're going to start in 2006, in which the year was, this is the year that the book Multitudes came out by author Osharit Negri, which is pretty much a book about how we really can't think in totality anymore, that that's over with, we really have to think like on the local level of micro actions. That same year, Joshua published um, a poetry book entitled Totality for Kids. So <laughs> totality is still here and even the kids need to be learning about it. Um, in what else did I got? Uh, 2011, as some people will remember here, we were occupying this Capitol building up on State Street. Joshua was occupying the US Bank um, outpost at UC Davis, so also going the opposite direction, maybe related, but opposite. Um, and about uh, in 2016 this year, I had the um, uh, interesting and awesome experience of hosting Joshua for a conference um, in Texas during which the open carry laws were being enacted, and Joshua gave pretty awesome talk about how maybe open carry on campus isn't the big deal, maybe it's cops on campus because they have guns everywhere. So that was a little bit of a, a little bit of a barnstormer um, of an issue. And then most recently he's been writing about how novels aren't actually the genre that tell us the most about capitalism, even though this has kind of been a long form kind of like assessment, like we look at novels because they tell us a lot about the way that capitalism has worked since the 19th century. And Joshua's like, no, it's not really novels. It's poetry. <laughs> poetry is really what tells us the most about financial capital. Um, so he likes to take some oppositional stances. Um, I'm sure that will be made clear here too, but uh, that might give you a little bit of an idea of kind of a little bit of an intellectual overview for where he's come from and where he's going, which I'm sure will continue to be in opposition to things. Um, but is one reason he's an enjoyable person to follow, um, both for controversy and for illumination. Um, he, for the traditional bio, I will just say that Joshua Clover is a communist. Uh, he's also a professor of literature and culture, cultural theory at the University of California, Davis. He's a widely published and translated essayist, poet, and cultural theorist. And his most recent books are Red Epic, which is um, with Commune Editions, which is an awesome publisher if you're up on contemporary poetry, um, and Riot Strike Riot, The New Era of Uprisings, uh, with Verso Books. Um, and then you can also read his writing on the images of Black Lives Matter, Baz Luhrmann's The Get Down on Netflix, if you like that show, and pop music as anti-police on the nation's website. So there's the more traditional stuff. And we can go over to Joshua. Oh, and I should also say the Haven Center and the Center for Humanities are hosting. Sorry, I'm bad at that. Thanks, Nora. That, I, I'm casting, casting it that way makes it seem like there's some intellectual or political seriousness to my inclination to say no to things. I just say no to everything, and sometimes it seems more significant. Um, th thanks for the introduction, and thanks again to uh, the Haven Center, the Humanities Center, and the other people who've helped with this visit, and thank you all for coming. I'll say it again in case you came in late. Uh, today's talk, if you were at yesterday's talk, today's is slightly more formal in the sense that I've written it down. Uh, and we'll be reading from it, but there's also a certain amount of text I'm going to be referring to that's going to be on the screen. It's not the world's biggest screen, uh, and so, and it's important to the talk. So if you're worried you're not going to be able to see text considerably smaller than that on the screen, there are definitely more seats up front, and you should feel encouraged to move forward. I'm going to take down our, our little screensaver and start the slideshow, as one does. 
This song is David Bowie's response to the Great Rebellion of Detroit in 1967. At the time, the most destructive riot in U.S. history. Uh, that riot and one in Newark, New Jersey in the same year are at the heart of this talk, along with the Chicago riot the following spring. The complex of problems that they raise remains very much with us today and has been with us for a very long time. The complex has multiple axes, but to pull out just two of them, uh, I want to start with, on the one hand, the question of sort of the racialized domination, immiseration, and destruction, and struggles around this question. Struggles which today in the U.S. are best known under the ambiguous heading of the Black Lives Matter movement. The other axis tracks the question of the form of struggle itself, which was yesterday's topic for those of you who are, who are here. The question of what shape political antagonism can and does take. I want to suggest that these two axes, the questions of racialization and forms of struggle, align in a tense and transformative way in the 1960s. A temporary balance of forces, which is lost to us now, but whose passing provides a useful refraction on the present moment. In perhaps the most famous meditation on the opposition of determination and agency, Karl Marx wrote that, on the one hand, quote, people make their own history, but on the other hand, they do not do it as they wish, but rather within circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Uh, many of you will know that passage. It's from Marx's arguably most famous bit of historical writing, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, worth mentioning because today, as it happens, is the 18th Brumaire, year 225 of the French Revolutionary Calendar. So it is, in fact, the anniversary of the original 18th Brumaire in which uh, Napoleon first seized power in St. Cloud. This is a Lego replication <laughs> of, the, of those events, which has nothing to do with my talk, but when I discovered this morning that there was a Lego representation of that event, I really felt it was my duty as a scholar to include it. So again, Marx's opposition is between people making their own history, uh, but doing it not within circumstances that they have chosen, uh, but rather those given and transmitted from the past. I am peculiarly interested in the circumstances existing in the late 60s, and the changes, particularly in the material recompositions of class and race in the United States and elsewhere, recompositions which were in this moment not just changing, but at the pivot of an epical transformation of the ground for politics. Now, it feels kind of liberating to be invited to the Center for Social Justice, uh, and the kinds of arguments I've been freed to consider in the book Riot Strike Riot are of a different sort of nature, genre, from those I've been accustomed to making as a literature scholar. But poetry will have its say, and that say is today. The material herein, again, about the dynamic of social struggle, will likely end up in a larger collection about North American poetry after 1973, perhaps called The Transformation Problem, perhaps called How It Ends, Poetry and Crisis. I haven't chosen a title yet. In another version of this talk, a sensible version, I might follow the, shade of, uh, the, the fate of Percy Shelley's great poem, Mask of Anarchy. There's the last stanza captured in this handwriting. Written after the Peterloo riot of 1819, a catastrophically violent police riot against the beginnings of the Chartist movement that would change the course of British history and of labor history. That's the famous final stanza, as I said. In this sensible paper, I would note how, though the poem is a poem of riot in 1819 or 1830 when it's first published, by 1911, with the ascent of the labor movement, the poem was used as an organizing tool for the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, and how a century later, the last stanza was cited repeatedly in reference to 
uh, student riots in London over austerity policies, culminating in the sacking of conservative headquarters. So the poem itself follows a nice sequence, riot, strike, riot, in its engagement. And if I were looking for the moment of balance, I would go to Phil Levine's poem, They Feed, They Lion, which tries to capture how Levine, a former auto worker in Detroit, sees the racial tension and immiseration of the city, especially among those expelled from southern agricultural work who have migrated to Detroit searching for steady labor that in the end cannot hold them, labor balanced against dispossession, white worker balanced against black, the tension building all the time, a poem that borrows its figure of unvanquishable rage directly from Shelley. So you can't see this passage from uh, Levine says, from bow down, come rise up, come they lion from the reeds of, of, of shovels. And this is Shelley's last verse, rise like lions after slumbering on vanquishable number, shake your chains to the earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you, ye are many, they are few. <coughs> so that would be the sensible talk. You would have been persuaded. <laughs> but because I am not so interested in being sensible, or persuading you. I will instead take an approach of almost pure nonsense. I will start with analytic philosophy and use it as an allegory that is at best willful. We can expect it will be a train wreck. So this is about the trolley problem, one of the better known thought experiments in ethical philosophy. Has anyone in the room ever encountered the trolley problem? I'm curious. A couple of you have, I think. Its only real relation to today's subject is that it's from 1967. It was formulated by Philippa Foote, it's a great name, Oxford <laughs> professor, and although a Brit uh, British citizen, granddaughter of Grover Cleveland, the only US president who ever served non-consecutive terms uh, here in the US. The trolley problem has also spawned a number of variations, many formal studies, and become a subject for cognitive science, neuroethics, popular psychology, and recently has figured in the debate concerning the programming of self-driving cars. It has also produced any number of internet memes, and we might wonder why 1967 has returned so dramatically in the last few years. The trolley problem is glossed uh, universally, much as it appears on its own Wikipedia page. That's what you saw before. You will see that the version provided by Foote is a bit different, but not substantively so. As it happens, I think the trolley problem provides an interesting and ambiguous meditation on order and disorder, on the balance of forces in 1967. There is the trolley coming down the street, an aspect of social life now evident as a remorseless, inhuman agent of death. There its path, set in advance by powers not presently in evidence, but nonetheless predictable, determinate. And there is the moment when human agency enters, the opportunity to intercede by a willed activity and alter the outcome. You perhaps see already my crude leap into the open air of history, wherein the trolley problem might be taken as a meditation on determinism and agency, which I hope to suggest in theoretical register of the political opposition between organization and spontaneity. Now, those are some big ticket items. I hardly think we can resolve them in the next half hour or so. I do think this double transcoding discloses some critical ambiguities within these concept clusters. To grasp our own present, We'll need to wrestle with these ambiguities. We'll be satisfied to name them, I think, and see what poetry was trying to do with them. Now, there have been no shortage of long, hot summers in US history. 1967 featured almost 160 race riots. We discussed this yesterday a bit, how race riots is a deeply problematic term. For those of you who won't, aren't here, the fundamental problems with the term, there's two. One is it actually takes race to be sort of a natural or essential characteristic that's itself self-evident and can be discerned simply by looking. The other is that insofar as we do see US riots organized uh, explicitly around race or in ways that are identified as such, there's a longer history of what we call white riots, which involve white populations subordinating populations of color, not just African Americans, but also Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants, famously 
uh, Latinos and Latinas and the Zoot Suit Riots and so on. So the history of racialized riots in the United States is largely a history through the 1950s of white people subordinating uh, populations of color. And then there's this sort of polar reversal uh, in the 60s to the form that we now most familiarly, familiarly recognize and that people identify as race riots. And that's the title that gets used in the Kerner Report, the most famous study of this phenomenon uh, commissioned by the government. 1967, which spurs the Kerner Report, features, as I said, almost 160 of these events, the most on record. 1967 is Black America's 1968, counterculture with a vengeance. The most memorable are the Newark riots and the Great Rebellion in Detroit. They are in part remembered in a series of poems that have endured into the present, as well as many poems that have not endured so well. There is perhaps no better measure of the moment's magnetism than the fact that Maya Angelou, a compass of sorts, would feel pressed to point back at the events in Riot 60s from 1971. You will see, if you can see it all, that the poem approaches the riot by way of assembling, via a sort of free indirect discourse, a collective of racialized cliches about blackness, a, a, a tradition we will return to. In 1967, we're early within the new era of riots, the, the uh, era I described as riot prime in the, in the book and from yesterday's discussion. We're within a transition. The riot has not yet quite recovered its 17th and 18th century primacy. In 1967, the strike is experiencing an autumnal flare. It cannot yet be known that this will be the last golden gleam before winter comes for the US labor movement Retrospectively, we can see that within a situation of global volatility for which a leading cause and ongoing consequence is the deindustrialization of the overdeveloped nations, strike and riot are vying for pride of place within what Charles Tilley calls the repertoire of tactics for collective action. The former, the strike, is historically identified with a kind of ascetic discipline and administrative structure, formal or informal. The latter, affectively charged with the sense of chaos, violence, indiscipline, de-repression, the pairing of order and disorder. Now, we can continue from there with our transcoded concept clusters. The strike is a specter of determination, of the production by the logic of capital of its own grave diggers brought together in association on the great factory floors. The riot is famously found guilty of spontaneism in all its terrible limitations. The ability to act, but without the tracks of determination that coordinate and direct the accrued capacity. The strike is the very figure of organization, both logically and in its historical role within the class mass party sequence. The imperative organize has as its unspoken object the strike. The riot provides the equivalent figure for spontaneism. The End Notes Collective suggests four main characteristics of this spontaneism, linking it directly to the problematic of determinism and agency. One, it is unpredictable because freely willed. Two, disruptive. Three, it is creative, generating new content for struggle. And correspondingly, four, it generates new forms, reminding us that the riot is a paradigmatic <coughs> form among forms not a unitary and total approach. Elsewhere, I describe it as a mode of circulation struggle. So, back to our allegory. The trolley coming down the street, the dialectical debt of materialism coming due, must thusly be the strike, not the riot, or so it appears. But the thought problem has a race problem. In the United States, Riot and strike are raced, black and white, respectively. I am not claiming this is true. Latino and Latina labor militancy and the long supply of white riots I refer to testify to the contrary. Moreover, riots tend to be fairly heterogeneous over and over again in their actual participants. Nonetheless, we need think only of the insistent use of the very category of race riot against the aggressive racism of the AFL craft unions which succeeded in deferring the formation of any black-led unions until the 1925 charter of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. The decisive entry of African Americans into mass unionization does not come until the 1941 UAW strike, 
centered around the River Rouge plant outside Detroit. So in some sense, I'm making a familiar point. There's an under-examined tradition within Marx's reception of scientific socialism, which is itself racialized, which associates historicity, associates materialism itself and the accompanying claim to be an agent of history, precisely through the objective determinations of capital's unfolding with whiteness. And specifically with the white proletariat of the early industrializing nations. The so-called race riot, contrarily, is spontaneous, subjectivist, disordered, unable to make history, lacking an inner materialist logic. Or so we are given to understand. But this critique is foreshortened precisely because the relation of strike and riot changes. It must change. And thus, the racialization in which it is involved is subject to change. And this is perhaps the best reason to go to 1967. Not to all the riots, not to all the strikes, but as I said, to the situation of volatile balance, of transformation as one tactic overtakes the other. This tilting balance is nowhere more apparent than in Newark and in Detroit, two cities that successfully industrialize early and concomitantly begin their deindustrialization early as well, its effects appearing first among non-white workers. Industrialization and surplus population are serial, overlapping, and inextricable, the populations of strike and riot, respectively. In one reading, the book Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, A Study in Urban Revolution is entirely about this. The Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, known as DRUM, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers are extraordinary apparitions, black labor organizations with avowedly revolutionary horizons. I would argue that they appear and vanish in this very narrow window, say 1966 to 1973, precisely because they are at once riot and strike. And only in this transitional period is such a thing possible. Even here, the rifts are open. Drum and the League of uh, Revolutionary Black Workers members found concurrently the Detroit chapter of the Black Panther Party. That is to say, the same revolutionary grouping endeavors to be militant labor and militant non-labor, both at once but the Detroit Panthers swiftly fall into conflict with the home chapter along the exact lines of what I am calling the trolley problem. If the League found the Panthers' strategy too external to the labor struggle, as is intimated in this passage, and too close to the riot, so to speak, the National Black Panther Party leadership felt the reverse. By 1969, the Detroit chapter of the Panthers had been excluded around these positions, in effect for being too close to the strike, too involved in labor organizing. That is to say, the confrontation of strike and riot as political polarities, setting the prices of labor and of market goods in the classical distinction, is mediated through social struggle in general, but within black militancy in particular. Poetry in the moment cannot escape this particular material problem and the particular ambiguity of materialism which is at once absolutely real and absolutely in motion. As always, Amiri Baraka recognizes the situation with damaging clarity. The Newark riots begin with the beating of John Smith, a cab driver, by police. Baraka, a resident of Newark, will be similarly beaten during the ensuing events. A contemporary piece of his would be used against him in his trial, the poem Black People which offers, having surveyed a list of department stores in Newark, the famous formula. All the stores will open if you say the magic words. The magic words are up against the wall, motherfuckers. This is a stick up. For all the talk of Baraka's nationalist openness to violence and the racism and misogyny that seem to inher adhere to it, Less has been said about his theory of riot. He identifies looting, the price setting of market goods, as the signal tactic. As Tom Hayden, who recently <coughs> passed away, as you'll know, Tom Hayden from the SDS, and later a 
political figure who passed away quite recently and actually was the first person to write a history of the Newark riot. He was also living in Newark at the time. It's kind of amazing who was living in New York in 1967. It's kind of like, how did that happen? Um, uh, it's really quite striking. But so he writes the first uh, sort of journalistic account of Newark um, and notes, the riot was more effective against gouging merchants than organized protest ever had been. The year before a survey was started to check on merchants who weighted their scales, the survey collapsed because of disinterest, bad usage. People needed power, not proof. That's Hayden's practical assessment. Baraka's language of magic, of the spell, is, I think, profoundly ambiguous in its irony. Looting, and by extension riot, are doubly identified as irrational in and of themselves and or recognizable only as unreason by a white audience. Later, Baraka will take a side. Looting may be materialistic, but it is not materialist, and it is a failure of revolutionary consciousness. His memoirs, these are written in the 1980s, to, uh, his memoirs, to be sure, follow his own traverse from uh, Milana Karenga's cultural nationalism through black power to a classical Marxist internationalism. Part of what I've been arguing is that his later view is mistaken, even according to a Marxist historical materialism, that deindustrialization, implicit in the material trajectory of capital, perforce moves both the locus of capital and of growing surplus populations beyond the hidden abode of production into the noisy marketplace. And the domination of production side strategies, such as the strike, is bound to wane in that situation. By going back to 1967, I want to be attentive to the crucial step that Baraka takes. He argues that the repertoire of riot produces blackness itself. So this is back to that same poem before, People always look at the famous passage up against the wall, motherfucker. But he notes at the end, he's saying, let's make a world we want black children to grow and learn in. Do not let your children, when they grow, look you in the face, look in your face, and curse you by pitying your Thomas ways. And that's spoken to the people who would have declined to take part uh, in the riot, and identifying that as a, a, the, the refusal to take place in the riot as a failure of blackness itself. This surely is the sense of Black Magic, his book title, the name of the collection in which the poem appears, the magic which is the making of blackness, which is the form of struggle from which both theory and poetry, if we must distinguish between the two, must arise. That is to say, racial ascription and ascription of meaning to strikes and riots, these are conjoined activities. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, I referred to this yesterday, has provided an eloquent model of racialization uh, for the era of surplus populations. She uses the term racism in her book, Golden Gulag, on the management of black populations since this moment of transformation. She says, the state sanctioned or extra legal production of, and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. That's her definition of uh, racialization. The riot is like the new prison industrial complex, a specter of this new surplus population as problem both for racialized groups and for capital itself. As Baraka suggests, riot both intensifies and inverts the double process, completing the circuit of racialization by insisting that whites must encounter this vulnerability in premature, to premature death as their own. And this is the dialectical reversal of 1967. As the strike and riot swap places, the latter takes on a logic of historical necessity, of determination, through the material transformation of racialized capital and class composition. Then, when this happens, racialization must also switch. Whiteness must see itself, not in the trolley coming down the street, but in the man or group of men who are in its path, one way or another. If this reversal is implicit in Baraka, it is explicit in Gwendolyn Brooks, who saw Baraka perform the poem that year and wrote her own poem, Riot, two years later. Brooks identifies her poem as a response to the riots of 1968, following the assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. 
She begins the poem with a study in whiteness at its most rarefied, with the most Brahmin name on offer, John Cabot, all white blue rose beneath his golden hair. Down here, the description says, I know you can't read the red at all. Uh, so that's uh, all white blue rose beneath his golden hair, and here it's John Cabot, itched instantly beneath the nourished white that told him his story, told his story of glory to the world. So this sort of insistently marked extreme whiteness of, of Cabot. Now the dialectical turns come thick and fast. Raya is set in 160 cities, but it is also set in Newark, a city that deindustrialized early on in the 50s, sending its industrial workers into service work, into the circulation sector, a canary in the national coal mine. John Cabot's name must be paired with John Smith, not the Jamestown captain, but the Newark cabbie, almost certainly a slave name. John Smith, whose beating sets off the Newark riots, who is subsequently charged in classic fashion with assaulting an officer, and who is, in a story followed nationally, convicted three days before King's murder, a largely forgotten moment of the precipitation of the 1968 riots. Now, this moment is worth reflecting on for a moment. It is increasingly significant in our own presence, present as the phenomenon of the verdict riot grows ever more prevalent. Now it most often takes the form of an officer's acquittal, uh, which the judge or magistrate must endeavor to stage manage so as to minimize the chances of a riot breaking forth, waiting to issue a finding until it's late at night, late in the news cycle, in bad weather, whatever seems most available to suppress the passions of the angry crowd. But I digress. I want to return to the poem. So there's John Cabot. So white, he's almost French. There's several <laughs> references, actually. He's eating grenadine de boeuf at Maison Henri. There's a uh, passage in French, uh, uh, which surely is meant to sort of hi highlight a particular kind of whiteness coded as French. I believe the word we're supposed to think of is bourgeois. Uh, so there's John Cabot, and there's John Smith, the two Johns, both outside the good old productive economy, albeit in opposite directions. There they are in a riot. But that's not quite right. It is John Smith, necessarily, but in truth of the text, it's the Negroes. From John Cabot's perspective, they become an it, which is blackness itself both abstract and particular, and on ineluctable and fatal course toward him. So this is the passage where we get his inner monologue. He says, don't let it touch me. The blackness, Lord, he whispered, to any handy angel in the sky, but in a thrilling announcement, on it drove and breathed on him and touched him in that breath of fume of pig foot, chittering and cheap chili. And that turns out to be sort of blackness itself as an abstraction uh, approaching him. And it's not quite that they're all in a riot. The poem's great drama comes in the middle. Fred Moten has said in reference to this moment that, quote, Negroes coming down the street, as the poem says, is the constancy of riot. And poetry is a way of arranging that constancy. This was in conversation, and I'm paraphrasing, but not terribly, I hope, and I think he is largely right. In this poem, the Negroes aren't in a riot, they are the riot. But here the constancy gets strange, the riot has changed. It is coming down the street with ineluctable force, with determination, not detainable and not discreet, and John Cabot is stuck in its tracks. The riot is now the determined, the organized, by history, if not also its participants. The riot has become historical in this moment. The balance of forces has shifted. The riot is now, in 1967, the trolley. And the poem is a way of organizing this inconstancy, the exposure to these transformations. And if the dialectical racialization of the riot, raced and racially ascriptive, if this has not changed, the meaning of blackness has itself transformed in this change 
from not trolley to trolley, from disorder to historicity, from pure spontaneity to historical determination. One last turn before we finish. Back to the trolley problem. Back to 1967. It turns out that it is not a trolley problem, not really. In Foote's original formulation, the trolley is the third formulation, that, the variation that she offers. The second concerns a crashing airplane, interestingly enough, which will be the bridge to the trolley formulation. But the first formulation should concern us. The original formulation of this famous ethical conundrum is qualitatively different. You'll discover, in fact, that the trolley problem is originally about riots. Suppose that a judge or magistrate is faced with rioters demanding that a culprit be found guilty for a certain crime and threatening otherwise to take their own bloody revenge on a particular section of the community. At the end, in the case of riots, the mob has five hostages, so that in both examples, the exchange is supposed to be of one man's life for the lives of five. This is a peculiar moment indeed, doubly peculiar. Peculiar in the first instance, because it turns out this supposedly abstract ethical problem is fundamentally located in the historical situation of 1967, which stays with us to this day. That it is in no way abstract, but utterly concretely located in a problem. And the second extraordinary uh, oddness of this is that this has been completely forgotten. That we have managed to erase this fact entirely. The first example offered is of the riot, and yet we now think of it only as the trolley problem, and its material history and its historical location have been entirely obliterated, making it impossible to think the ways that it is always already a racialized problem. And that might be one way to think about the trajectory of how we understand uh, riots and their development is their relationship to race and the desire not to have to think that as a particular historical problem by a particular set of people. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your patience and your attention, and we can do question and answer if people would like. If people have questions. Sure, I can. I mean, that's a tough question because it involves making claims about sort of conscious activities that I'm not sure I understand. Um, and you know, it, the narrow thing to do would be to say, like, well, it's philosophers, right? So, I mean, this is a this is a classic problem from philosophy departments. Uh, that that's where it gets thought. Philip Foote is a philosopher, um, and uh, uh, we could say, like, well, so. Uh, the trolley problem sort of percolated through philosophy departments before it became generalized and sort of a, a question of broader discussion and eventually internet memes and, th and things like this. I don't think that's terribly right, although I do think that the framework of academia does this, right? But we would call this a, a sort of a classic example of structural racism. Like, I don't think that we need to imagine a person who sits down and says, oh, here's this interesting ethical problem, which is the riot problem. Let's make a move. I, I, I don't want to think about the riot problem because that has a racial aspect to it and I don't want to have to confront this racial particular problematic, so I'm going to erase this part and pass up. So like the moment of how it happens, I don't really know, but I take that to be an expression of uh, the general structural racism that pervades not just academia, but the society around academia, uh, right? So that um, Someone says, like, oh, the clearest version of this is the third one with the trolley. And someone else says, yeah, I get that. It seems really clear to me. And suddenly you have this big agreement that that version seems more um, sort of pure and logical and thus available to an abstract thought experiment that anybody can engage in. But of course, it's that anybody that's the basis of the structural racism because it's not anybody. The idea that there's an anybody, that there's a universal subject, uh, uh, is a, you know, this historically vexed idea, there is no universal subject, there is no person 
uh, for whom the world is perfectly neutral and they simply see it as it is, whereas other people are subjectivized in various ways. And that very imagination is the imaginary of colonization imperialism, right? So I take, that, I take the, the process by which the riot problem becomes the trolley problem in that narrow cauldron in the 60s as a way of not thinking a problem that's endemic to structure and, but that is expressed through individuals. Does that make sense, as sort of a way to think about it? I don't think so, yeah. But the, but the idea of like the, the perfect thought problem, the sort of the, the problem that's ethics or metaphysics and not historical, always imagines, I don't know about always, I don't want to overstate my case, consistently imagines uh, a neutral person who's just a universal subject, a pure thinker who can purely think a problem without any of the predicates of race or gender or these various categories, right? That are the categories exactly that are under dispute because another historical transformation we're looking at this moment, right? We've talked about the transformation of the economy from a production-centered to a circulation-centered economy. We've talked about that as a shifting relation to racialization and who's in the productive sector and who's not. But there's also this political transformation, right, where the old left is collapsing uh, and we're starting to see the rise of the new left and particularly of new social movements that organized around these identity categories and want to insist on these identity categories uh, within the new social movements. And uh, and it's the new social movements exactly that will argue in various ways while there is no universal subject. Like that imagination of the universal subject, subject is tied to um, the universalization of the white European male, 19th century proletarian labor or whatever. Uh, and so that exact dynamic of the question of is there an abstract position from which to think the world uh, is raised by this moment of effacement uh, of, this, of this tradition. So that's why it's it happens all the time, that of facing, but the, the peculiarity of it happening in this moment sort of lines up with these various transformations uh, that I'm trying to think through. Yeah. Yeah, the front thank row. you for this talk. It was great. Uh, just a quick follow-up to this question. And I was wondering if you think that something similar happens in poetry. In other words, is uh, our reading of poetry within the academy without also repressing that part of um, sort of the riot in poetry? Mm -hmm. Or is poetry the way of reading it? Uh, in other words, what's the role of, of poetry there? Tell me a little bit more. Well, I'm thinking, you know, you've read the poems and, and, and your readings are persuasive, um, but I'm wondering if those poems are being read consistently, if they're being read uh, uh, as poems of, of riot, or, or, or is the question of riot being somewhat um, sort of repressed or suppressed? Yes and yes, even though you had an or between the two of them. Right. So that's, that's an interesting question. So these poems are fairly commonly, commonly read. The, the trajectory of how much African-American poetry is read in undergraduate programs in the United States has changed dramatically, and it changes in different parts of the country. It seems quite uneven. I've had a chance to review syllabi in various places. I've been a poetry professor for longer than I'd like to admit. Uh, so I've seen uh, quite a bit of this, and we've seen various changes. But people like Gwendolyn Brooks and Mary Baraka are fairly, fairly well read. Not Shakespeare level, but, uh, um, but, but, but fairly well read. Uh, and, you know, certainly like Brooks, you know, her poems, it's called Riot. She, she's, not, she's not trying to, like, get us to think about something else. Right. Um, and yet, um, the engagements with these poems um, rarely seek to take up Riot as a historical question about race and racialization. They certainly, they certainly recognize, as there's no way not to, that there's this thing that happens that's a riot and that it seems to be about black people being angry. And in fact, the accounts of that are long-standing and often just sort of quite condescending and right and sort of classic kinds of um, noble savage bullshit. Or, well, it's just an explosion of, it's an explosion of anger and misery. Of course, people, of, of course these people are immiserated, but without any sense that it has a larger significance um, that it's historic, like that the riot is a historical act, that it's a kind of class struggle, as I tried to talk about yesterday a little bit. It just gets, so in a way it gets thought, so as to get not thought. Like, oh, it's this spasmodic moment of 1968, and now we didn't have to think about it, and then someone says, well, where's the, where's the poem of uh, Ferguson? Where's the poem of Baltimore? Where's the poem of Charlotte? Where's the, and everyone sort of worries about these, and, and well, in some sense, we already have some of them, we could refer to these. Uh, there's no doubt moral becoming, there's other places to look. Um, so, 
So the, the way it gets thought without being thought is the way I would argue it, and that, that seems worth res restoring to me, if possible. Yeah. Dan. Uh, I'm sorry, it was going to be kind of long. I guess I, 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 it's a little incoherent. I'm not going to answer it then. <laughs> it's, 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 about, it's about Drum and the, the, uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And, uh, Do I need notes you, here? Hold on. Okay. <laughs> the, the, way you, you, um, the way you put uh, the Black Panthers um, <laughs> on, on kind of like uh, in, a, in a, uh, uh, a formation in a, in a riot mode. Um, so my question here is um, I read the Black Panthers like ideologically as you know, having it, it's like a nationalism, but within the sort of worldwide anti-imperial mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the riot, the actual rebellion, the, the actual Detroit rebellion, like for people who know the history of that, of course, the, pre the precipitating event was this bust up, right, of the after hours club. The blind pig. Of, of a celebration of these returning African-American servicemen who had been in Vietnam. Yeah. And that's why people were pissed off, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a kind of like a, a sort of like raw, um, like elemental anti-imperialism there too, in mm -hmm. a way, mm -hmm. right? Or it's linked mm -hmm. at least to the to this uh, a kind of like you know a, a, an imperial situation mm -hmm. that the that the country is involved in and these whatever. Okay. So I guess the question, my question here is. Um, uh, what is the relationship between the way you, you think about riot and like what you talked about yesterday, riot as an intervention in, in, the, in circulation, how does that relate to like, anti-imperialism? Mm, such a good question. <laughs> um, a complicated one, but a good one. Um, so to take a step back, I actually didn't describe um, riots as interventions in circulation. I describe them as circulation struggles. There's a different, like, so some people have the, like, the most ambitious account of riots is like, oh, they're going to be a riots and they're going to block circulation and they're going to bring capital to its knees because you won't be able to ship stuff from here to there and capital depends on shipping and it will collapse. I'm not that optimistic. Um, so I don't want to oversell the way to which riots are interventions or use that language in particular, they're the kind of struggle you do if you exist in the sphere of circulation as a market dependent but not, wage, not necessarily wage dependent person. So that's a d brief delimiter that doesn't really affect or answer your question, I just wanted to, to clarify. So the relationship between like circulation and anti-imperialism is a big topic, it probably wants a couple books. I'm not sure I've thought it through as well as it would deserve to give you an adequate answer, but here's a couple things about it. So right again, the sphere of circulation is the sort of the social arrangement of what I refer to as surplus population, people who've been pushed out of the formal economy and the formal wage, um, and thus are left to struggle in the sphere of circulation, um, which is um, the category that Marx referred to originally, or a version of the category that Marx refers to as the lumpen proletariat, right? I don't use that term. I think it's a vexed term. I'm a, I'm a Marx guy, as you can perhaps tell by the beard, but, <laughs> but um, I, t I take difference with him in various places, and his account of the lumpen proletariat is one of them. He refers to them as the grimy scum, <laughs> the grimy froth, uh, sorry, not scum, the grimy froth flirting. Uh, on, the, on the labor pool, he has absolute contempt for them and their political capacity, and I think he's wrong. But I didn't invent thinking he was wrong. Lots of people did, and the most important thinker did is Franz Fanon. Right? Fanon, in 1960, is already sort of on this identification of the lumpen as um, the revolutionary population, and he has it very much in these terms about the inability to internalize them into production, so he has this account, chapter two of Wretched of the Earth, I think, of the lump and going from the country and colonized nations to the city and trying to get entry into the economy and not getting entry into it and circling around the city waiting for a chance in and sort of gathering up at the edge of cities. I showed you some data yesterday about poor people gathering at the edge of these mega slums in the world. It's like that's the Fanonian thesis. Um, so that identification of the lump and who've been excluded from the formal economy as the revolutionary subject, I don't know about revolutionary subject, but certainly the subject of riot certainly the population of riot, in Fanon's account is deeply related to the question of imperialism. It's related to the structure of these economies, right? These imperial economies which cannot absorb this labor of these uh, 
of Africans coming to the, to, the, to the colonial capital and trying to enter into the economy. So already we have a relationship between the question of imperialism, colonization, its structure, and the development of the category of lumpen, first as an absolute fact in its magnitude, but also as a, uh, a politically significant uh, fraction of the population. Then we make our next move, following the complicatedness of your question, to what the Black Panthers are thinking about, which is, so Huey starts reading Fanon in 1965, 1966, and starts to develop, along with some other people, uh, an account of this Fanonian passage uh, in relation to what people are still calling the ghettos in the United, in the United States, um, and about the relationship between ghetto populations as internal colonization in the US and its relationship to imperialism, with the argument being that U.S. imperialism, in fact, rests on the immiseration of um, the lumpen in U.S. ghettos. So there's a fundamental solidarity and political tie between uh, the racialized lumpen in the U.S. ghettos and the colonial lumpen that Fanon is writing about. So that's their whole account. Um, and I think that starts to give us a set of the chain of relationships between the inability of the economy to internalize people to the wage at a global and local level, and then a colonial international lumpen and a local lumpen in these uh, communities that the Black Panthers are interested in, of which Detroit is a is a uh, extreme example uh, because of its of the intensity of its deindustrialization, its production of a huge lumpen population very quickly between 1960 and 1967. Um, so I think that's the set of relations that you're asking after. That said. I want to be clear, I put, the, uh, I put the Panthers on the side of riot, but that involves a couple of transfers. The Panthers themselves did not advocate riot. If you read through the Black Panther newspaper, it's full run, which is worth doing, could be hard to do. It's sort of shocking to me that this doesn't exist in the world, you can't just walk and buy a, a book that's a compilation of all the issues of Black Panther, or at least the ones from uh, the first 10-point program through 71 or 72 when they're still a fairly vibrant organization, uh, but you can't, right? So I went to the archives and, and looked at them. They're not opposed to riots, but they see riots, in the, right, the essays they write, they're, they're unsigned, they're almost surely by Eldridge Cleaver. Um, after the, these riots in 67 and 68, they're like, riot, but move on toward kind of, kinds of organization. But their organization is incredibly minimal. They say, groups of three. And then they sort of somewhat Maoist, right? But it's a groups of three, and then there's a, this great uh, illustration of a group of three sort of panther-dressed youth, um, one operating as lookout, one um, out in the street, and one with a gun around the corner, and sort of recommending that as a kind of... And, and that's not quite the riot, right? It is a recognition that the space of struggle is not going to be organized labor, and that's the opposition that I want to bring into... Uh, fine detail, that it's going to be a different kind of insurrectionary activity that doesn't happen through labor struggles, but through, but in, in the street, right? The street, which is the space of riot, if not the riot itself. So I put them unevenly on the side of riot in my pairing, uh, but I want to be clear that it's not like um, Huey and Eldridge and Bobby Seale were like sitting around going, like, everyone should riot, because they, they weren't. Um, does that start to answer your yeah. question? Yeah. Sorry, it was a long question. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi. You, I, I feel like I caused you to be grumpy yesterday. Any, no, no, not things grumpy. Things a little better? All right, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to be a contrarian. Oh, well, we love contrarians here. Yeah, so um, my question now is no. for <laughs> It was uh, said during the introduction, and I kind of feel it as a strain throughout your talk, which is how poetry is situated to talk about, respond to, riot more so than the novel as a form. Um, and I'm kind of curious about your assertion. Um, I am sort of personally and intuitively persuaded that poetry can be like more subversive and has some of that potential to be kind of political or anarchic. Um, but I'm kind of curious to hear from you why you think it's better situated than the novel. What about poetry formally maybe? Or if you just think that uh, if your assertion is more historically contingent, like poetry has just happened to be the one to take up the cross, if that mm, makes any sense. Mm, mm. Definitely not the last. Um, I'm not sure here. Now, I'll be so contrary that I'll disagree with my own introduction. Um, <laughs> like Nora's account, I'm not quite sure I would co-sign, except that I think Nora's 
smarter than me, so if she says it, it's pro like, even if I don't agree, she's probably right. Um, she's completely right that, that, I, that I argue that the novel is no longer the paradigmatic historical literary form. I'm not sure that it's poetry, although I, I want to be able to say that, because um, I love poetry, I really love it. <laughs> um, uh, I don't love all the scholarship, but I certainly love po poetry, right? And I really want that to be the case, I'm not sure it might be video games, it might be reality TV. comic books, it's not reality TV, <laughs> Patrick, thank you. <laughs> well, the Kardashians. No, um, uh, so I'm not sure it's poetry, but I do have some intuitions around it. Um, they're kind of complicated. I've written some kind of annoying scholarly essays on this I could send to you. Like one version, there's two versions I'll give you as briefly as I can. One is, that I think the, the, the maybe there's three. Um, one is that the restructuring of the global economy has happened along both spatial and temporal lines. So spatial lines, you can think of like supply chains. And temporal lines, we can think of credit and debt, right? Which is a way of extending economies through time. Where like, I give you space now, I sell you a house, and you give me money, you give me your labor in 20 years, and for the next 20 years, right? So it's a kind of shifting in space and time. And I tend to think that poetry is a little better formally to handle the intersection of space and time than novels are. Right? Novels are extremely temporal. They're like the transformation of consciousness over time. Right? They're extremely temporal. Whereas poetry has all this like, spatial moves on the page, and it's actually it's part of how it communicates that like this is here and this is there. Right? So it has a little bit more of a communication vested in its spatialization. Uh, and so that's maybe one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that the novel, and this is, goes straight to like Luke Hodge and like sort of standard theory of the novel in the 20th century, the novel, he describes being about the reconciliation of the problematic individual to the social whole. Like he says that's the paradigmatic mode of the novel. And I read that as being a story about being able to internalize people into the dominant social structure, which I read to be a fundamentally political economic claim about capital's ability to internalize people. So you're born free but you have to be productive by the time you're 17, right? And capital has to be able to internalize you um, and give you a job. And, like, you can run wild and have your room spring up, but eventually you're going to end up in the factory, right? And that's the, or in the office building or wherever it is. And that's the internalization to, to, uh, to the logic of the economy on which the novel is premised. Uh, and that internalization, I argue, is no longer possible, right? Capitalism now expels people. It, it, fewer and fewer people out of the global population are actually part of the productive economy. Um, and the capacity for it to internalize new labor inputs is diminishing or gone. So that's another reason. But then the third, and this might be the simplest, easiest, most effectively powerful answer is, and, but also the most prejudiced one. This is where I just come out on the side of poetry. Like, I actually believe that poetry has a better tradition of making demands on, on um, radicality than the novel does. And I don't mean political radicality. I mean radicality in the sense of like radix, the root, right, of, of, of making absolute demands. Like I think it's no coincidence that Saint-Just after the uh, French Revolution says, uh, you know, Hugh makes a revolution by halves, digs his own grave, right? That's poetry talking. Like poetry that takes itself seriously goes all the way. It doesn't go half the way. Uh, whereas novels, in part because of the way they're marketized and various other reasons, very often do go halfway. And so I like to think that poetry has a spirit of like, uh, radicalization that's part of its internal logic. Of course, I read so many poems that don't feel that way to me, and then I feel bad. But these are my most, op these are, these are my most optimistic accounts. I want to read Baraka, I believe it. You know? Well, and if I can ask a really quick follow-up, um, more just about sort of the title of this presentation, because um, I guess when I heard the poetics of riot, I was thinking of poetics uh, in the very academic way of like kind of world-making or the grammar sort of of riot. And what I heard you talk about was more like the poetry of riot. Did you want to comment on that at all? On if you, on if I maybe oh. <laughs> in my assessment there, or these are such fascinating questions. Um, yeah, that may actually just happen. I mean, I'm, I'm aware. Of, I'm aware of that tension. That was that was in my mind. Okay. Um, I'm a little grumpy of the scholarly development where people talk about poetics this and poetics that without ever referencing poetry. And I kind of would like to keep them both in the same room. Yeah, um, no, I hear you. Um, right, because otherwise people tend to use poetics and actually mean all kinds of like, they mean like the affect of, the architectonics of, the 
or, or the thematics of, and you're like, dude, that can't be what poetics is. Um, and maybe if we hewed a little closer to poetry, what poetry is and what it does, we'd hold on to a coherent sense of the, of the term. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm not sure I can totally make sense of your question, which is to say, I mean, on the one on the one hand, um, see, we can go back to the foot. Um, on the one hand, yeah, the difference, the, the the distinction between a riot and a lynch mob is an interesting one, right? I, th I think it asks us to think about things like the difference between freedom fighters and terrorists, right. um, and, and sort of uh, what you identify as sort of on who, who, what side you're on or what your social position is. But the main thing I would say is she uses the word riots, right? Like, she used, like it's not me who says riots, it's, it's her. And she has certainly had that language available to her. So, um, I mean, her uh, grandfather was Grover Cleveland who oversaw um, as president, uh, a great uh, number of lynchings in the United States between 1996 to uh, uh, 1900 and then 1904-1908. Uh, and uh, so she had that language available and she chose that, but the thing you describe, someone actually could describe it as a, as a lynch mob, right? And this problem pers pr persists in these strange legal codes, which perhaps you know about, right? Where um, in a riot, if, um, you know, uh, uh, Patrick has been arrested in the riot and the police have him hostage and Nora and I endeavored to run over and set him loose and pull him free, maybe we succeed, but if we fail and they capture us too, the charge we get is lynching. Um, there's a funny legal code, right? right. Um, so there's a funny mm -hmm. legal relationship between the category of lynching and the category of riot, which I don't know what to say about except that it's entangled and weird, and so you're right to raise it as a, as a puzzle. But... But, I mean, all I can say is, like, she says riot, I'm like, huh, riot. It's, she also, I can't quite figure it out, I've been trying to track, so she, she is a guest lecturer in the United States in this period, including at UC Berkeley, um, but I can't, I don't think she's there during the Berkeley riot period, 64 to 69 or 70, roughly speaking. I've been trying to figure that out, but it's, you, when you write random emails to Cambridge historians, they never answer you, <laughs> they don't answer you. <laughs> one, day, one day I'll get an answer. Any other questions? Nora, you wanna be the last question? You were the last I question yesterday, weren't you? Last no, you were last question. No, yesterday's last question was good, so all you can do is ruin it. <laughs> yeah, I'll well, down over here. I mean, I don't have a super formulated one other than just trying to think about the, the dialectics of determination and spontaneism that, spontaneism that you set up and coming back on this end of kind of like the riot is actually being entirely determined, in lots of ways determined by mm -hmm. the prehistory of, of the industrialization mm -hmm. and the reasons why we should see race as the, the, the trolley kind of like coming down, the, product, the production of um, a racial, like racialized surplus population. Um, but then I'm also think I was just also thinking about like the really long history on both the right and the left of thinking about the riot as spontaneous in a way that can get coded really conservatively, which is like, oh, there's no thinking there, there's no thought there, but in a way that seems also like it has like a utopianism to it, like what if this could just turn everything around? Like what if there there's almost a kind of mess messianism or something to a kind of um, investment in spontaneity? You mean like the idea that the spontaneity so the reason, I'm, I'm sort of going to try and re-say what I think you're saying, and I might get it wrong. And I, um, but so the idea, on the one hand, from the, from the conservative position, the riots, uh, or maybe from any position, like the, the riot spontaneity is a problem, not just because it's out of control and thus threatening to um, the bourgeois subject, but because it lacks a historical logic and determination and thus lacks force. That's my case that I make, right? But that its other side is that it could actually be 
not a failure to, to um, be an expression of determination, but a breaking free from the shackles of determination into a world where we're not determined um, and could simply be spontaneous in some sense, and that could be our emancipation. Mm -hmm. Do people think that? That seems stupid. <laughs> I think it's mostly a question, is that like, is that part of what gets coded into, like, is that part of the reason why sometimes riots get coded as spontaneous, even on the left or something, which is not just because... Um, well, I think, I think we get coded on that way especially. Like, the left is more interested, like, the left will use the logic of spontaneism because they have this tradition handed down from Leninist thought, basically, right? Um, uh, and, and have this language around determination materialism. Like the, 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 the right party of order is basically just like savages. They, like, there's no good reason for this. It's just irrational. Um, whereas the left party of order will move to this language of spontaneism so we can understand it, um, but uh, it doesn't have the the power of socialist organization that we need it to have, and, 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 and so on. So I'm trying to figure out who, I mean, this thing you described, the utopian imagining, I'm trying to figure out who, aside from the rioters, might, might have that. But maybe it's, I mean, maybe that's one of the imaginations of, of rioters. And like, the argument I've tried to make is, um, not that the consciousness of rioters doesn't matter, but that the commitment to the, con to the consciousness, the status of consciousness of rioters has been a tool of um, repression, devaluation, racialization, and various, various things like that. To say like, oh, um, the classic sequence of like, oh, this person looted a flat screen TV, it's always a flat screen TV, right? And, and, the, and the example that proves people are irresponsible, like whether it's rioters in Ferguson or um, in, like impoverished people in Greece who like bought flat screen TVs on credit, for some reason it's always a flat screen TV. Someone needs to write that essay, why it has to be a flat screen TV that proves to us that people are irresponsible. The answer is reality television. <laughs> um, um, but and say like, oh, this person stole a flat screen TV, thus we know that they're not rioting for good political reasons, they're rioting for greed. Um, and greed is the, is the great explanation slash, sort of pseudo explanation uh, line of exclusion. So, I'm trying, I'm not trying to get to this idea of like, um, that I think is true about consciousness, but I, I don't want to have to rely on, like my friend Tyler says, um, about riots, that the experience of being ungovernable is a transformative experience. And I think mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. true. I don't know if anyone here has ever been in a riot. I assume we would all deny it, but, but I, I recognize when he says that, like I've had a pang of recognition for me. Mm -hmm. um, but the experience of being ungovernable also always comes with fairly swiftly thereafter with the experience of being super governable, <laughs> um, whether you're in jail or whether you're just back to your shitty daily life. Um, so I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure sort of edging around your, your, your question, right? Which is to say my inclination is to figure spontaneism as utopian would either have to be a misrecognition um, of what the basis of emancipation is, whether, it's, whether emancipation is in your mind or in your material conditions, um, or it would have to be prefigurative, right? It would have to be like, well, okay, we're not emancipated yet, but we can live as emancipated for the next two hours or 14 days or however long a, a riot lasts. Um, and it will prefigure some kind of emancipation available in the future. I am leery about prefigurative politics, and I think we might differ on this. Like, I'm very leery about the virtue of, of, of prefiguration. Um, you know, I think back to Occupy, right? That there was a lot of discussion around prefiguration and like, oh, we're all living in these camps, but it's, we're prefiguring the society to come. We're having like free giving. It's not a cash economy. And, um, and it was kind of, first of all, it just didn't strike me as true that those, those encampments depended wildly on lots of people having jobs and bringing in cash and buying stuff and, and so on. But also those camps, and like I was in one and I loved it, but they were shitty. 
Like, they were fucked up. And, like, bad stuff happened all the time. It wasn't prefiguration. It was trying to solve a series of problems, right? If you've made a decision not to let the cops into your encampment, and then someone in the encampment starts acting really fucked up way, sexually harassing someone, for example. This happened, right? Um, and you have to figure out what to do without reference to the cops. That's not prefiguration. That's solving a set of problems, or starting to try and solve a set of problems that we will indeed have to solve if we want to emancipate ourselves from the state and capital. And so in that sense, it's practice. But practice and prefiguration are not the same thing. And I'd like to hold on to that distinction. I don't know where that gets us, uh, but that's where I'd sort of like to leave it. Thank you all so much for uh, uh, your attention.